I want to say uh, good morning again uh, to my brothers and sisters in Christ. We have a, another message for you this morning. Today, uh, we're going to be, again, we've been in this series, Under the Blood Covenant. And again, today, we're going to be talking about the Blood Covenant. And specifically, the topic we're going to be talking about today is taking dominion, taking dominion through spiritual law. This is a very, very important subject that we're gonna talk about. Given the environment that we're in right now, we've seen uh, really, really some perilous things taking place. We're seeing uh, a lot of leadership failures. We're seeing a lot of pride in America. And uh, we're gonna be talking about some things today that will position you where you can begin to take dominion over your own life, okay? And we're gonna use some scripture law today. We're gonna be digging down into scripture law and I want you to understand the whole purpose of law and why the Lord has given us laws. And I want you to open your mind, open your hearts to what I'm gonna be talking about today because there are a lot of misconceptions about what laws really are about and what they really do. Now, Pastor Williams has been teaching on spiritual warfare, okay? So I want us to be able to integrate the teachings that both of us are doing. And when you look at spiritual warfare, I want you to look at our opening scripture, our title scripture today, Romans 8 and 2. Warfare is based off of these two laws. I want you to look at this. For the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now, these two laws are antagonistic, or they oppose each other. So we need to understand how these two laws work, okay? So we're gonna spend some time digging into this. Now, the law of spirit of life in Christ, notice the combination, the law of spirit of life, spirit being capitalized, Holy Spirit, okay? Spirit of life in Christ. Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Now let's look at this. Once I'm born again, okay, through placing my faith in Christ, then I have access to the Holy Spirit to lead and guide me, okay? That's the first law. The second law here is the law of sin and death. This is the law that Satan, through tempting Adam, he brought the law of sin and death into the world. So we see these two opposing laws, spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death, which came in through Adam and Satan. Remember in the garden, Yahweh told Adam, if you partake of the tree, you will surely die. And we've covered death in our teaching. Death means separation, okay? We had a detailed discussion on that. Now, as I look at this law, there are spiritual laws and there are natural laws, okay? One of our challenges that we have, and, and I'm gonna deal with this, we obey physical laws or physics more so than we do spiritual law. And that's a problem because spiritual law is even more powerful than physical law or the law of physics. Now, let me talk to that particular issue. When we talk about physics and physical law, we respect the law of gravity. We don't run around uh, jumping out of buildings because we know the consequences. That, that's a physical law, right? The law of gravity, okay? Then there are other laws where we know that uh, 
two people or two things cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Therefore, we don't get on the interstate uh, in the lane where an 18 wheel is coming because we know the 18 wheel is going to end up occupying that space. We respect those laws of physics. Now, let me give you another example of these two laws. Think of one here as being uh, a, a law of physics, okay? We, we're going to call this one the law of gravity, all right? And we're going to call the law of spirit of life in Christ. We're going to call it the law of lift. And we're going to use an airplane as an example. Now, we know that under the laws of physics, that the uh, law of gravity governs the earth. But man has figured out a way to overcome the law of gravity through the law of lift. In our example of the airplane, man is able to fly because he discovered the law of lift. And the law of lift consists of two components, okay? One of them is propulsion that causes the airplane to move forward and have a forward speed, okay? The second part of the law of lift, it, it, it creates a vacuum on the wings of the airplane. There is an airflow over the wings and that airflow is designed in such a manner when you combine the proportion of the plane and the design of the wings, the air comes underneath the wings and cause the airplane to rise up. So there is the law of lift, which allows us to overcome the law of gravity, okay? Now, the law of gravity still exists it's just that the airplane has been able to overcome that with a higher law called the law of lift. Got it? Now, so if those rules or principle or laws that govern the law of lift are violated, the law of gravity will take over again and that airplane will come down out of the air. Now, Let's transition since all truth parallel, I just gave you an example of how the law of lift is able to overcome the law of gravity. Now, in this case, when we deal with spiritual law, the law of spirit of life in Christ will enable us to overcome the law of sin and death. And that's what this scripture is saying for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So the law of spirit of life in Christ is a higher law that allows us to overcome the law of sin and death, okay? Now, let's go to our introduction. Every kingdom has its way of doing things. It's referred to as a kingdom culture. Culture is really important. Culture really, really sets the stage of how you think. It, it develops your thinking. It develops your training. It, it really develops your whole lifestyle. So culture is really important. And we have a way of doing things in the kingdom of God. It's referred to as the kingdom, of, the kingdom culture. The kingdom of heaven, which is the kingdom that all, every born again Christian is in, <clears throat> He's coming to the kingdom of heaven and it's governed by spiritual law. So if we don't understand how to conform to spiritual law, we're going to have difficulty being successful in the kingdom. God has a way he governs the kingdom of heaven and we have to become familiar with those laws if we want to be successful. Now, let me say this. Some of us do not like to change. And your Ill inability to change and you resist change and you grieve the Holy Spirit and, and we do things that quench the Spirit and this makes our life even more difficult. So if you don't like to change, 
I don't, I don't want to waste my time and your time trying to teach you. If you're locked into your ways and you refuse to change, then this is not going to help you because you've got to be open to change in order to function in the kingdom of heaven. Now, let's talk about how this is so important that we're able to change. It tells us, and be not in Romans 12 and 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So what this scripture is telling me, my thinking has to change. I can't conform to the ways of the world, so I have to be transformed by the renewing of my mind and the way I think, that ye may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Some of us can't find God's perfect will because we refuse to change the way we think. God has a way of thinking. Heaven has a way of thinking. And the scripture tells us we have the mind of Christ. I like to say we have access to the mind of Christ. It's up to us to utilize the mind of Christ, okay? So transformation is a really, really critical part, okay? We have a saying in our ministry, re renewing minds, transforming lives with spiritual solutions to worldly problems. That's our logo, okay? Uh, point A, our hearts must be restored and our minds and our mind slash thinking must, must be changed in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. The Bible talks about a term called repentance. It's the biblical term that the Bible likes to use. So I want you to understand that, and we're gonna drill down into this further, but faith is a system of knowledge. Faith is a way of thinking, okay? It's beyond, believing is a step, okay? You have to believe God, but once you believe God, your thinking has to conform to what the scripture says. When you're reading the scripture, you're seeing the way God thinks, you're seeing the way that Christ thinks, and our thinking has to be conformed to the way that Yahweh and Yeshua thinks, because if our thinking doesn't change, the manifestation of what God's trying to do in our lives can be blocked in our soul because our thinking is not aligned properly, okay? Now, let's move to point B. Most Christians are confused over the meaning of the term law in the Bible. They immediately think of the law of Moses, the Mosaic law. Stay with me because we're gonna go deeper now. But the New Testament, but New Testament faith is a law. Have you ever thought about faith as being a law? We're gonna deal with this term law, okay? What law really says is law tells you what is required to be successful. What is, law tells you what is required to function the way God designed you to function. So if you don't understand law, then you will never function the way God designed you to function. So when we move into the New Testament, what I want you to understand, the New Testament has law in it, all right? But it's a different type of law. It's not the Mosaic law. So don't get stuck and confused over this term law. Follow me right here. Romans 3.27, where's the boasting then? It is excluded. By what law of works? Nay, not by the law of works, but by the law of faith. There we have it. By the law of faith, right out of the New Testament, faith is a law, it's clear it's a law, all right? Now, let's deal with this term law. Law, in the Old Testament, referred to as Torah, okay? That, that's the Hebrew term, Torah. What does it mean? To teach, 
Holy Spirit is a teacher. Yahshua was referred to a master. He was a teacher. Okay? Yahweh is a teacher. So if you don't like instruction, if you don't like to be taught, if you're non-teachable, then you're going to have difficulty functioning in the kingdom of heaven. You're not going to be able to adapt to the kingdom culture. It's different than the culture in the world. So Yahweh, as I just said, has taught us in his word what he requires of us, okay? Law tells us what is required in order to function the way God designed us to function. Got it? All right. Now, when we go to Psalms 37 and 31, it says, the law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. So law guides us. It has to get in our heart. It has to come out of the scripture, out of the Bible, and it has to get inside of us. Then we have a living word in us. This word will allow us to think a certain way. This word will allow us to make decisions in a certain way. This word will allow us to bring our emotions under control. And this word will give us the mind of Christ. Now, not only if this referred to the law of God in the, in the Old Testament and some, look at Hebrews 10 and 16. This is the covenant. We're back to the blood covenant now. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord, all right? I will put my laws where? Into their hearts and their minds will I write them. Notice he referred to heart. So when he says heart, he's referring to our spirit and our soul, that whole area that we referred to in our last teaching where we talked about post-salvation rehabilitation, remember the diagrams I gave you, and that whole area of spirit and soul, we referred to it as the heart. So there is a relationship here between the mind and the heart area, okay? So we're in the New Testament scripture here. So we're establishing that faith is a law, all right? Okay, let's move on. Okay. A key component in building or creating anything is functionality. Let's talk about this. What, what is functionality? Functionality basically says, what are we designing it to do? What is the design functionality? What do we want it to do? Okay. That's critical. How do we want this thing we're functioning? What do we want it to do? That's what functionality is, okay? So you have to determine design functionality. This is what we want it to do. Once functionality for the creation is determined, requirements must be developed, okay? If we want it to do a certain thing, we have to have the requirements all right, that will cause it to do what we want it to do. Got it? All right, requirements, what's needed to function properly? What is necessary for a creation to function in accordance to the standards of the creator? The creator determines how you should be functioning, okay? So you've got to know what the design standard was in order for you to determine whether you're functioning properly or not. If you've never seen what the original design standard was, you will never know whether you're functioning properly or not, okay? The creator determines the standard. Now, this brings to mind and memory to me, I was once responsible are developing a business system, the business requirements for a new computer system. We went through this process. I, I, was, I came to 
Memphis on a project. And that was our goal, to develop a brand new system. So the first thing we had to do with this system, we had to determine what is the functionality. <coughs> Excuse me. What do we want it to do? That was step one. Begin with the end in mind. What do we want this thing to do? Okay. After we determined this is what it must do, then we went back and we developed the requirements to fulfill what we wanted it to do. Okay. So I was the, the part of a design team, just like God created and designed us. He knows what he designed us to do. All right. Requirements are laws of operation to function properly. Let me say that again. Requirements are laws of operation to function properly. So once you understand anything, if you're going to take dominion over things, first thing you got to come to an understanding of what are the laws of operation that makes this particular thing do what it does and once you understand the laws of operation you can begin the process of taking dominion over that particular operation okay that's why we are talking about taking dominion through spiritual law but you got to understand how it operates now we know how god has designed us to function but here's the problem. When Adam sinned, sin distorts Yahweh's law of operation and causes us to malfunction. So sin is sort of like a virus in the computer. Once you get a virus on your computer, it causes your computer to malfunction. A malfunction says the computer is not doing what it was designed and created to do. Right? So that's what sin does. It causes us to malfunction, and that's a, that's a major problem. We got to come to an understanding of that. It causes us to malfunction. But Christ, Yeshua, came. And he is the antivirus that fixes this problem of sin, that brings us back to the design standard that we were originally created for, that we can function the way God designed us to function. That's good news. Watch this. Fear is a malfunction of faith. Faith in reverse is fear. That's why. Over 60 times in the scripture, we hear the scripture telling us to what? Fear not, because fear is a malfunction of faith, all right? If you're functioning in fear, you're not functioning the way God designed you to function, okay? Spiritual and natural laws are critical for exercising dominion over creation. So you, we've been waiting around for somebody else to fix something. Listen, you're waiting on your leaders to fix problems. It's not going to happen. Christ has come, has been fixed. It's up to us to walk in and understand what he's made available for us, okay? This thing in the world, it's only going to get continuously worse. I'm not being negative. I want you to face reality. That's where this thing is going. Okay. So we have to begin to prepare ourselves, my brothers and sisters. We have got to stop being entertained and we've got to learn how the kingdom of heaven function. Your ears have got to stop being tickled. And you really got to get deep down into this doctrine and understand it, okay? The blood covenant functions by spiritual law. 
The blood covenant functions by spiritual law, okay? Now, we've introduced you to spiritual law. We've shown you that faith is a spiritual law. We said that law is requirement. God has taught us in his word what he requires of us in order for us to return back to functioning the way he designed us to function. All right. Now, we're going to get into some very, very important spiritual laws now, okay? I don't want to overwhelm you, but I'm going to give you an overview of several of what I consider critical spiritual laws that you need to become familiar with if you're going to take dominion over your circumstances in this law, in this life. And we do have challenges, all right? We are in some challenging times, so we've got to go deep and pull these things out and put them to work for us. The first spiritual law I want to talk about that's under our blood covenant is the law of blood sacrifice for the atonement and remission of sin. Okay? You cannot come back into a relationship with, with Yahweh until your sin has been atoned for and you have remission of sin, which is the sending away. Because God is holy, sin has to be dealt with to come into a relationship with him. We see this in the Old Testament. It tells us for the life of the flesh is where? It's in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement, a covering for your souls. For it is the blood that make an atonement for the soul. So your soul has been atoned for through blood. That's why we always refer to this as a blood covenant. Don't ever lose the word blood out of this particular covenant. Because without the blood, there is no covenant. Without the blood, your sins have not been remitted. Without the blood, there has not been an atonement. Very, very important law. I'm calling it the law of blood sacrifice for the atonement and remission of sin. Now, this is an Old Testament scripture. Let me give you a New Testament scripture on the same thing. And almost all things are by what? The law, there's that word, by the law, purged with what? Blood. And without the shedding of blood is no remission. So we got Hebrews 9 and 22, Leviticus 17 and 11, basically telling us the same thing we're using scripture to interpret scripture. So we can draw a conclusion here. There is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And we know in the Old Testament, the, the blood of lambs and goats were shed. And we know in the New Testament, the precious, precious blood of our Savior, Christ, was shed. Okay. That's the first law that we've covered, right? Okay, now, in our introduction, we dealt with this Romans 8 and 2. For the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. So we got two laws that really, I often say, that govern the universe. You're either one or the, you, you under one or the other. You either on the spirit of life in Christ, choice, the will, where we make choices, or you're under the law of sin and death. And we know these two are adversarial. They fight. Warfare based on these two spiritual laws. That's what Pastor Williams has a whole series talking about this. 
what I'm teaching you today complements what he's talking about, okay? You've got to understand this. You've got to get under the Holy Spirit, and you only can get access to the Holy Spirit once you place your faith in Christ. That's how you come out from underneath the law of sin and death. Okay. That's the second one we've covered, all right? Now, let's move on. The law of grace and humility. Woo. This is why right now we're in trouble in Western society. We're in trouble in America because we've blown this. Our leaders don't understand this law and many of the people are following the leaders, okay? So that's why we're in the trouble we're in. Let me talk about this law the law of grace and humility. See, the problem in the world is the world is full of pride, okay? The, 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 the reason we're in trouble, and I'm gonna talk about this and I'm gonna be quite straight about it. Uh, we here in this country, we don't respect authority. I know people don't wanna hear it, but we don't respect authority and, and that's why we're having such difficulty with COVID-19 because everybody want to do what they want to do. But we have no respect for authority. We don't understand this law of grace and humility. Look at what it says in James 4, 6, and 7. But he give it more grace. Wherefore, say it, God does what? Resisted the proud. He resists the proud. You, you got to get this, people. He resisted the proud, okay? But give it what? Grace unto the humble. You have to humble yourself. You got to humble yourself, all right? Now, watch how this authority fits into this. Notice the next word. Submit, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. That's saying respect authority. That says submission is very critical for the law of grace and humility to function in our lives. We have to submit ourselves, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We want to resist the devil, but many people don't want to submit. You got to submit to God first if you're going to resist the devil. Now, notice this. God resisted the proud, all right? So, look. You're resisting the proud. Here God does. And then here he's talking about resist the devil. Can you see something right here? God's fighting with pride for people because pride for people are under the control of the devil. Nobody want to talk about that. They refuse to acknowledge the authority, the authority that God has over our lives. Now, I'm gonna I'm gonna share a scripture with you on this. It and you need to go back and read this scripture. It's in Matthew chapter eight, starts at verse five and goes through verse thirteen. This scripture deals with the centurion. You remember the centurion soldier? Christ was coming into the city of Capernaum. Okay. And the centurion soldier said his servant was sick. Serious sickness, okay? And he pleaded with Christ. He said, my servant is sick. And Christ said, I will come to your home and heal your servant. But the centurion soldier was so humble. Remember what he said? He said, I'm not worthy. I'm, he humbled himself. I'm not worthy for you to enter into my house. Look at the humility. Next, he said, watch the submission to the word. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. I want you to watch the submission that this centurion soldier had. He said, I am a man under authority. 
I'm under authority. I tell my soldiers to do this. I tell them to do that. And they do it. They respected authority, okay? Now, here's what I want to tell you about authority. You have to be under authority in order to receive authority. <coughs> You've got to be under authority in order to receive authority. And that's a big problem we have now. Nobody respects authority. So he's told Christ, just speak the word and my servant will be healed. He understood the authority of the word of God. He said, Christ, you don't need to come to my house. I'm not even worthy of you entering my house. But I, I understand how authority works. So all you've got to do is just speak the word and my servant will be healed. And that's how the healing happened. And Jesus said, I have not seen such great faith, not even in Israel. Christ referred to his faith as being great. Immersed. Galatians 2.20. This is another challenge with the law of grace and humility. We haven't crucified our old man. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ live in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me too much of our old self is still in the way. Paul said, I'm crucified. The old me died with Christ. Remember the scripture where Christ said, pick up your cross daily and follow me. Crucify yourself daily and follow me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. I'm not living the old life. I'm living the new life because I'm a new creature in Christ. Yet, but not I, but Christ what? Live it in me. I've got to get out of the way in order for Christ to manifest himself through me. Okay, I live, what, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We see in John 3 and 30, uh, we see the same thing where it says, he must increase, but I must decrease. So let's look at some critical things under this law. First of all, I have to, I have to humble myself, all right? Because God gonna resist the proud, but he's gonna give more grace unto the humble. And I have to understand submission to authority in order to function in the kingdom, all right? Crucify myself daily. I, he must increase, I must decrease. Very, very important law. This opens up access to all the treasures, all of the supply that comes from heaven. Now, one of the things I want to mention here, we understand grace as favor. We understand it as unearned, unmerited favor. That's accurate. That's true. I'm going to reveal to you a dimension of grace that you may have not thought about grace in this way. Grace is a supply system. So when I do these things that I've talked about under this law, I open myself up to be for all my needs to be supplied from heaven. But I've got to understand how these particular laws work. 
Okay. Now, there's another law that mirrors the law of grace and humility is the law of faith. We just talked about faith being a law. Where is the boasting? It is excluded. By what law? Works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the Mosaic law. All right? Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing is one God which shall justify the circumcision by what? Faith and the uncircumcision through what? Faith. Do we then void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. So the Old Testament law, taken out of the way, but we establish a new law in the New Testament. We establish what? The law of faith. All right? For Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availed anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. You see how we're putting these scriptures together? See it? Faith is a requirement. Faith is a requirement to function properly in the kingdom of heaven. Okay? You've got to have it. Look at Hebrews 11 and 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's a requirement. You can't please him if you don't have faith in what he has spoken in his word. It says it right there. That spells out Hebrews 11 and 6 is a requirement to function properly if you've ever seen it. But without faith, it is impossible to please him because God can't supply you with anything without faith because faith is a receiving system. Under the law of grace and humility, God has a supply system. There's a system that mirrors grace and humility. It's the law of faith, which is a receiving system. So without faith, I can't receive anything that God has made available to me because I don't have a receiving doctrine. Get it? Got to have it. You see how powerful these laws are. And as we learn to work these laws, we will begin to take dominion over the earth. That's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to exercise these spiritual laws to take dominion over the earth because God gave us dominion. Yahweh gave us dominion. Okay? And we've got to take it back so we can run this place the way God intended for the earth to be run. Okay? Now, we saw in the previous scripture, and it told us that faith worketh by what? By love. So we got a law of love, faith working by love. In other words, faith was produced by love, okay? Let's look at this. For God, you know John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Okay, why did God give his only begotten son? Because love was Yahweh's motivation for a solution to the problem of sin. So love had to be in place in order for faith to be birthed, okay? God had to give his son as a sacrifice okay, for faith to be birthed so we could have Christ's sacrifice, okay, 
as something to believe in so God could bring us back into his kingdom, okay? Now, John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another. Mm. That's a law. That's a requirement that we love one another. We're destroying each other. Mm, just the opposite. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, he's saying, if you love me, keep my laws. I'm talking about New Testament laws here, people. Okay, that's the law of love. We're hitting some heavy, heavy laws here. You gotta learn to work these. The law of sowing and reaping. But be not deceived, God is not mocked. For, whosoever, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We, we've already covered in our series, when we talked about blood covenant words, we share with you that words are seeds and they are containers and they carry things. So just like a seed carries things in it, words carry things. And you gotta know what type of seed you're planting in your heart in order to have a blessed harvest. We reap what we sow. This law works just like if a farmer goes out and plant corn, he's gonna get, the end result's gonna get corn. If he plants apple seed, he's gonna have apples. Spiritually, this works the same way. A man, we shall reap what we have sown. If you don't like the harvest you're currently getting, you, you sold something in the past. You sold bad seed. We got to sow good seed. And then we have to, once we sow, we have to be patient to give the seed an opportunity to fully mature. Don't harvest your crop too soon, let it become fully ripe to get the fullness of the blessing. But you gotta be, you gotta put good seed down. You have to exercise the fruit of the spirit called patience. You have to have temperance to stay with the plan. Don't give up, stay with the plan. The harvest is gonna come. The law of sowing and reaping. And then we got to understand the law of seasons. While the earth remained at seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, day and night shall not cease. Now we often look at this law, we, we understand the physical part of this and how it works. But we need to understand the spiritual side of seasons, okay? Seasons change. You should change. Some people were put into your life for a season. And when God tells you to move on, that's what we need to be able to do. So we gotta understand seasons. Okay, people, change. We gotta be able to change. We can't resist change. We can't resist the spirit. We can't quench the spirit when we are called to do something different. The reality is some of us are stubborn and we don't wanna change. We want things to stay just the way they are. 
And and my my question is, sometimes the way things are, not as good as you think they could be. Matter of fact, some of the things in the current conditions are not good at all. And and people want to just sit right where they are and resist the change when the spirit calls us to move. Okay. Be prepared to change seasons. Do something different. The last one I want to look at here before we get into our conclusions, I want to look at the spiritual law of leverage. You may not have heard of this one, so I'm going to give you a detailed example of how this law works. Spiritual law of leverage. Matthew 14, chapter 14, verse 14 through 21. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them. And he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place and the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the village and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus said unto them, they need not to depart. Give, give, give ye them to eat. You give them something to eat, is what Jesus is saying to them. And they said unto him, we have here but what? Five loaves of bread and two fish. Okay? Multitude of people. Five loaves of bread. Two fish. We're getting ready to see spiritual leverage go to work. What is this concept of spiritual leverage? Let me let me break leverage down to you. Leverage is when spiritual leverage is when the benefits exceed the input. The benefit is in greater proportion than the input. That's leverage. Leverage is when you put a small amount in and you get a large amount out. Small amount in as input, but the benefit exceeds the input in greater proportion. So here we have five loaves of bread and two fish. He said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded that the multitude to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed it and break it, and gave them the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. Where did he look? To heaven. He understood the laws of leverage. He understood spiritual law. So he looked to heaven because he wants us to understand this is how heaven works. Took this small amount, he blessed it, gave thanks, and he broke it and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat the benefit in greater proportion than the input and were filled. Nobody left hungry. Watch this. Everybody ate, everybody was filled, and they took up the fragments that remained 12 baskets full, and they had leftovers. They didn't throw, watch this, they didn't throw the leftovers away. I have a whole concept that this scripture talk, taught me. You know what this scripture taught me? A whole concept in business called fragment management. Yes, fragment management. You've been throwing the fragments away, but they took the fragments up so there would be no waste, 12 baskets full of fragments. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside the women and children. Five loaves of bread, two fish, fed 5,000. Spiritual law of leverage. That's how heaven can.
can work if we work it. If we learn how to look to God as our provider, learn these principles, work these principles. Okay, let's draw our conclusions. Summary conclusions on spiritual law. Spiritual law is the key to success in life. Spiritual law is the key to success in life. The lack of knowledge of spiritual law is the beginning of destruction and darkness. Spiritual law is illumination. Illumination from Yahweh is the ultimate life reference point. Illumination acts as a guide for life. Spiritual law is essential for taking dominion over the earth. And finally, spiritual law is the key to the kingdom of heaven. My brothers and sisters, I hope you have been blessed by today's message. And I'm prayerful that you will continue to support this ministry in any way possible that you can so that we will still be here available, Pastor Williams and I, to preach the word of God so we can continually illuminate people in a world that's filled with darkness. I thank you for your time, my brothers and sisters. We're gonna close out and end the session today. Love you. God bless you.